So pathologies allow us a limited insight into how nervous systems perform whatever it is that they're doing. Um, but there are difficulties associated with that. We have a great deal to learn from the study of other species as well. Um, the principles of nervous systems are probably conserved from their very, very origin. Um, and if we compare the brain of a human with the brain of a chimpanzee, we find absolutely negligible differences. Um, you can see the, some sample mammalian brains there along the top. And they differ. They differ primarily in the size of the neocortex, which is the outer folds. The structures that lie deep within the brain are highly conserved across all of these species. And it seems obvious that we would not expect a rupture between, from one species to the other in the way that this organ functions. In other words, the way the human brain works, the principles of its operation and the tasks that it does are probably extraordinarily similar to the way it works at least in apes and possibly in other animals far more remote from us. Um, nervous systems come in many types and the mammalian nervous system has many characteristics that are unique to mammals. Um, the jellyfish and the worm and the fly there illustrate quite different forms of organization. The jellyfish has what's called a nerve net without any center of control at all. Um, the fly there has two ganglia, which are like mini brains. Um, but because it's got two, obviously, you're going to have difficulty interpreting any one of them as a locus of control. And in fact, it's not clear that a brain should be regarded as a locus of control. Um, ganglia are simply local clusters of neurons in which uh, very many neurons in the ganglion have connections only to other neurons. So the, the majority of the neurons connect only to other neurons, whereas in a nerve net, most of them will have some connection to either sensory receptors or to motor effectors. If we look back in the evolutionary record, nervous systems occurred very, very, very early, around the time of the first animals. And nervous systems did not suddenly appear on their own. They came together with muscles. So muscles and nervous systems have a deep, intimate evolutionary history. The first animals in which we find these um, are known to us today, their descendants, as jellyfish and comb jellies. These are those simple nerve nets that we talked about. And although these animals differ in the form of locomotion that they use and even in the tasks carried out by their nervous systems, it's worth bearing in mind that our enormously clever, wonderful, complex brains are continuous with these structures that have evolved slowly. So what did nervous systems and muscles appearing together provide animals with? Because it was a good idea, it caught on. Without a nervous system, you are at a great disadvantage in dealing with an unpredictable world. Your opportunity to respond to anything is very limited and slow. And the ability to coordinate a large body um, becomes an insurmountable task large bodies need to have fast um, ways of communicating within the body so that something that happens on one part of the body can induce a response, um, a reaction uh, at a remote site. So with nervous systems and muscles, we get the ability to coordinate a large body under very unpredictable circumstances. And this makes animals now able to locomote and get around and find niches. It also enables then the development of specialized cluster, parts of the exterior of the body, which can, where we can cluster receptors. And this leads then to the differentiation of um, what we now think of as sensory systems. So the retina, the basilar membrane, these are concentrations of receptors whose effects are distributed throughout the body. Um, but they're very specialized surfaces, and this is only possible after the nervous system arises, of course. The evolution then of ganglia and brains, these clumps of neurons where most of the neurons are in connection only with other neurons, serves to make the responses of the body far less determinate 
so that the body is not merely being driven passively by the push and pull of environmental influences. And so we get this um, apparent autonomy or independence of the organism. Fast forward all the way up to humans and have a look at our brains and if we compare them to ape brains, we find they are the same brain, almost identical. There's no cell type found in ape brains that is not also found in human brains. Um, so if we are particularly interested in understanding a human capacity, which is not found in apes or in other mammals, language and reason come to mind, then brains are probably not a great place to look because brains are essentially conserved. Brains are more likely to provide answers when our questions relate to the kinds of tasks that we do and the kind of sensitivities that we exhibit, which we have in common with animals. So matters to do with locomotion, getting around in the environment, coordinating movement in the service of goals, those kinds of things we share with animals. But it's unclear where we should look for those features, skills, capacities and sensitivities which we think are particularly human. I want to talk about one particular kind of neuron which is of interest to us here precisely because it is found in ape brains but it is not found in monkey brains. So in the evolutionary tree there are we belong to a large branch uh, which we share with primates in general. And within the primate class, we have monkeys. And within the monkeys, then we have the, the apes. Within the apes, we have the great apes. The great apes, let's number them. Those are humans, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and orangutans. Um, and it's only in the great apes and the humans, there's the great apes including humans, that we find these particular cells. So that's of interest to us. And they were discovered a long time ago in 1929 by a chap called Constantine von Economo. And so they bear two names. They're either called von Economo neurons or spindle cell neurons. And if you look at them there, on the right is a pyramidal cell. This is a kind of a cell found in all mammalian brains, for example, in the frontal lobes, um, quite common throughout the entire neocortex. Pyramidal cells are um, very numerous, very familiar to histologists who study these things. Um, but the one on the left, the spindle cell, has a very different shape. Now, to the untrained eye, that might not be particularly obvious. But you'll notice that, for example, the, the bulk of the cell body in the pyramidal cell is at one end, and then it has a long axon. In the spindle cell, it's more in the middle, and there are projections on both sides. And there's a particular forking projection to the bottom of the slide there, which is unique to spindle cells. So that these have a morphological characteristic that distinguishes them from other brain cells, and they can be recognized on this basis. We don't have to... Um, convince ourselves of any functional story. We don't have to attribute any function to them in order to recognize that there's a different class of neuron here. Where do we find them? In the frontal lobes, of course. This is where we're going to go, and particularly in the anterior cingulate cortex, the base of the frontal lobes, and just above the eye socket, the periorbital cortex. So um, the distribution varies somewhat across the great apes. But they're in here, in that part of the brain, that's going to be really difficult to figure out. The anterior cingulate cortex is continuous then with the frontal lobes. It's very deep within. And here we do not have any confidence in our functional attributions. That is, it is probably wrong to say this part of the brain does that. Remember phrenology. Less cautious neuroanatomists and cognitive scientists have labeled the anterior cingulate cortex as being part of the quote-unquote social brain, a term I loathe. Um, I don't believe there is a social brain, but undoubtedly the complex lives of primates involve very, very serious embedding in social context. This will be reflected in the brain. And humans, with their massive big forebrains, have very complex social lives, I hope you'll agree. Um, and somehow this part of the brain is involved in all that. But we won't go much further than that. Here's a little plot showing the different distributions in the periorbital cortex, that's the bit just above the eyeballs, for those five great apes. 
And you can see that orangutans have very few, gorillas have um, somewhat more, but the numbers really kick off then with chimpanzees and bonobos where these cells form groups, and in humans they are far more widely distributed. So far so good, this was a very interesting anatomical finding, and it serves to make the claim that there's at least one thing that's different about the ape brains from all the other monkey and primate brains. Then the story gets interesting. Only about eight years ago, a discovery was made in the brain of a humpback whale, a female humpback whale, and since then repeated in other cetaceans, that's the whales, dolphins and porpoises. They had spindle cells in the same part of their brain. Now, these are mammals, of course, and we were not surprised to find very similar brain organization. But these cells, which we thought were peculiar to our ape lineage, have cropped up now in whales. Now, it's an interesting thing about these humpback whales and those cetaceans in general. They also have very rich social lives, not comparable to ours. They live in the water, for God's sake. They have very, very different kinds of lives. And female humpbacks have particularly um, strong social bonds. Within a pod of humpback whales, the females will form a coalition to jointly raise the calves until they grow up. And then the males will go off sailing the oceans on their own, while the females will form groups to raise the next generation. But we know relatively little, little about their social lives. But this is an interesting example of something called convergent evolution. That is to say, the same structures emerging independently in the evolutionary record, more than once. Now, we're familiar with this from the eye, because of the nature of our planet, because being sensitive to the distribution of ambient light provides you with an enormous advantage. The eye has evolved independently many times in the lineage, in, in the overall tree of life. What about this? It's not clear why we, wish we should see the spindle cells, but when we spot convergent evolution, we look for an account not inside the brain. We look to see what does this subserve? What are the conditions under which this structure appears? And then, bizarrely, they were found in elephants. This has now become a very strange story indeed. Great apes, cetaceans, and elephants. So we've got the same structure arising three times independently. They're all mammals, but there's no direct evolutionary link that can account for the presence of spindle cells in these three classes. And when we see something like this, we necessarily want to ask, what's the response to? So to give you an example of what kind of question we're asking, um, here's some examples of convergent evolution that we do understand. So these little creatures all look extremely similar. They all have long legs, big ears, a hopping gait. They all burrow. They're nocturnal. They share an awful lot of behavioral um, and ecological characteristics. They are um, found, however, in very different contexts. The North American kangaroo rat, the Australian hopping mice, the North African and the Asian Jerboa, they have no common evolutionary descent that can account for this. That is, if you trace their lineages back, they lose these features before they ever have a common ancestor. So, but there's an awful lot of things that go together here. Well, in this case, we have a good idea why we have convergent evolution, and it's because of the demands of a desert environment. They are all found in a desert environment, and all these adaptations make sense in a desert environment. So if you can think of a prototypical little mouse-like creature, and then modify that to suit a desert environment, these are the kinds of changes you would make. Now that leads us to ask, what about this convergent evolution of spindle cells in apes, elephants, and cetaceans? We obviously don't share a desert environment, the most likely factor you would put on the table here for consideration is the rich, complex, affective social life. We feel empathy for whales, and we feel empathy for elephants, and we understand something of their emotional lives. We understand the sense in which they tend to care for each other, which in other species can seem completely bizarre, as when one mother eats, the, eats her children, for example. Um, that won't happen with these species. So somewhere along the line, that which makes us human draws us 
to whales and elephants as relevant landmarks in the vast array of species out there. So von Economo neurons have a lot to teach us.